Welcome everyone in person and virtually to our event today, CSIS, Protecting National Security in Partnership with All Canadians with keynote speaker David Vigneault, Director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, CSIS. We are thrilled to host CSIS here at the Institute of Asian, Asian Research at UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. My name is Savannah Tuck and I am a student at the UBC Masters of Public Policy and Global Affairs program. Before going further, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, who have called this area home for many thousands of years and continue to call this area to do so today. Since we're connecting with many of you on a virtual platform, I'd invite you to reflect upon the Indigenous lands that you are on today as well. Our moderator today is Dr. Kai Oswald, Associate Professor in the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia. He is also the Director of the Institute of Asian Research and the Center for Southeast Asian Research. Professor Oswald's work is broadly on development, public policy, and ethnic politics. His focus is strongly on Southeast Asia, especially Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Myanmar. A few housekeeping notes. This webinar will be recorded and shared publicly on our SBPGA YouTube channel and with all registrants. For our virtual attendees, you're welcome to turn on closed captionings using the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll be hosting a Q&A session later in the event. For our in-person attendees, we welcome you to raise your hands to pose questions. For, and for virtual attendees, please post your questions on Slido by visiting slido.com on your device and entering the code national underscore score security, no capitalizations or punctuation. These details will also be posted in the Zoom chat. I am particularly excited about this talk by Director Vigneault as this, uh, the theme of this talk, I believe will build on the themes that I had the opportunity to explore in my global policy project this semester. And it is my pleasure to now welcome Professor Oswald. Thank you, Savannah for that kind introduction. Uh, bonjour, bienvenue à tous. It's really a pleasure to host CSIS for the event today. This is, as many of you in the room know, one of the main classrooms of the policy school. We grapple in this classroom with many of the challenges that the last several years have presented. Obviously, the global pandemic has touched us all in very direct and acute ways. But it isn't the only challenge we face. We discuss rising great power challenges, discuss the global uh, uh, climate change, discuss the impact of new technologies and modes of communication, all of which impact policy issues that we grapple with. They also, of course, impact the security uh, environment that Canada and other countries face. Amongst the greatest concerns we talk about is the way in which these developments contribute to serious polarization. With that destabilization of norms and institutions that have governed uh, both Canada and, and many close uh, allied countries. We've talked as well about alarming erosion to democratic norms. And that's not just in the distant afar, but of course much closer to home as well. When we discuss these issues with our students, we ask them to think carefully about conventional approaches and the ways in which conventional approaches may be poorly situated to address these emerging challenges. We ask them to seek constructive partners and stakeholders, conventional and new. We ask them to value diverse perspectives. We ask them to take seriously the gravity of these challenges, but also respond in ways that seek nuance, balance, and ultimately are led by evidence. As a professional school, we deeply value engagement with practitioners. And so it's an immense privilege to have the director of CSIS join us today to provide insights, not just on these emerging security concerns, but also on the ways in which CSIS as an organization is adapting and transforming to address them. This is an important conversation that I think you'll find parallels many of the ones that we are having as academics and academic institutions. Uh, the director's remarks will primarily be in English. There'll be a transcription of them in French made available. 
director will speak for approximately 25 minutes. After that, we'll begin with questions and answers. Uh, as was mentioned by Susanna, thank you. We'll begin with questions in the room and we'll take questions through Slido for those attending virtually. You'll have received the link for that in the RSVP email. I'd also wanna remind those in the room, pictures of the front of the room are perfectly acceptable, but please no pictures of the audience. So with no further ado, let me introduce our speaker. David Vigneault is the director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Services, the ninth director. He's had that post since 2017. Prior to assuming that, he held several other senior roles across the security and intelligence community. That includes as Assistant Secretary to the Cabinet for Security and Intelligence and as Vice President of Program Operations at the Canada Border Services Agency. For those of you on the West Coast, you'll know we weren't able to supply uh, warm weather and sun today. It's a gray and drizzly day, but please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Director David Vigneault. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, I have to acknowledge this is the first time I'm going to deliver a speech using my glasses. So apologize if I, it's very clunky. But, um, but before I begin uh, more formally, I would like uh, first to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional ancestral and non-city territory of the Musqueam people. I recognize that many of you are listening in different places today and therefore in traditional, other traditional indigenous territory. Avant de commencer, je tiens à reconnaître que nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui sur le territoire ancestral non cédé et traditionnel du peuple Moscouim. Je reconnais que nombre d'entre vous sont réunis aujourd'hui de façon virtuelle, en droit de traditionnel. Je vous invite à réfléchir à cette proposition. As a representative of the government of Canada and as a Canadian committed like you to the ongoing process of reconciliation, I encourage you to take a moment to reflect and acknowledge the land here. I would also like to thank, uh, take the time and the opportunity to express my sincere thanks to Kai for his kind words and the introduction, but also to uh, the ability to come be here at the UBC, at the Institute of, uh, for Asian Research during Asian Heritage Month to be able to speak to you uh, here in UBC, but also across Canada. I would also welcome the opportunity to wear a tie, which is you know, something that we have not done much in the last uh, two years. So um, I would also like to uh, thank uh, and commend the Institute for the work that uh, it has undertaken since 1978, facilitating important research, dialogue, and engagement to enhance our understanding of a range of important domestic, regional, and global issues is extremely important and welcomed. The Institute has delivered and continues to support these objectives and it is exactly for this reason that I am here today and why CSIS is proud of the ongoing relationship we enjoy with faculty institute and students at the Institute. À titre de directeur du Service canadien du renseignement de sécurité, ou SCRS, je parle de l'importance de tenir avec la population canadienne des conversations éclairées et franches sur les questions de sécurité nationale et de renseignement. Les menaces qui pèsent aujourd'hui sur le Canada et les défis que nous devons relever change et évolue rapidement. Il ne cesse de, compli de compliquer le contexte opérationnel dans lequel on évolue. Le Canada doit réagir avec la même détermination. On many occasions during my time as director of the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, or CSIS, I have expressed the importance of engaging Canadians in a, an informed and candid conversation on national security and intelligence issues. The threats and challenges we face today change and adapt with little notice and continuously complicate our operating environment. Canada also needs to respond with the same resolve. One of the best mitigation uh, for all of these problems remains to harden the target, as we say in our vernacular. In simplest terms, we must bolster our defenses and make it as difficult as possible for those who wish us harm to achieve success. This approach requires that mature discussion that I'm talking about here today, and also requires that we start by increasing transparency and build trust with communities. 
For our part at CSIS, we have been working hard to be more open and transparent with Canadians because we recognize that trust is earned. We are making this investment to build strong and meaningful relationships with those we are honored to protect and whose help we rely upon to carry out our important mission. These issues are too important and far too complex to be left to government agencies alone. We serve all Canadians, all communities, all sectors supporting our inclusive democracy, and we must strengthen our bonds to ensure that we can protect our wonderful country. I speak to all Canadians when I say that you have a partner in CSIS, a strong and dedicated partner, and we need your partnership and we work towards securing our country and building our collective resilience against the threats that we face. No one in this room or listening virtually would be surprised to hear that I believe that we are currently in the midst of a pivotal moment in history. The continued impact of COVID-19 pandemic has only accelerated the unpredictability of the current environment. Geopolitical, economic, societal, environmental, and technological changes are all converging, converging to reshape the world around us at an accelerating pace. People everywhere, including in Canada, are contending with the human, social, and economic impacts of these transformations. These trends are impacting our threat environment and in turn, CSIS as an intelligence agency. As authoritarian regimes exploit both conventional and new technological means to expand, expand their spheres of influence and control, democracies are being challenged to preserve our way of life and the rule, rules-based international order. The Russian Federation unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine and the resulting devastation being inflicted on the Ukrainian people are causing ripple effects across the globe, representing but just one telling example. The fight for democracy is one we cannot afford to lose. The world around us is changing at a dizzying pace, and so too is our country. The democratic values we hold so dear are at risk and trust in our institution is continu continuously being undermined. We cannot take our democracy or our institutions for granted. It is exactly for this reason that we need to be transparent, as, as, as transparent as possible with Canadians. The use of social media and other online platforms as vectors of disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, and hate spread by both individuals and states continue to accelerate and increase. This type of information, uh, manipulation, and propaganda can have serious consequences including eroding trust in our democratic institutions and in reason, deliberation, and science. It polarizes public opinion and amplifies conflicting narrative and messaging. The combination of major disruptive events like the pandemic, the ever-increasing influence of social media, and the spread of conspiracy theories has created an environment ripe for exploitation by influencers and extremists. This environment has the potential to inspire individuals to commit, to commit acts of violence. The threat from ideologically motivated violent extremism, commonly referred to as IMVE, is constantly evolving, fueled by extreme views around, around race, gender, religion, and authority. Both online and in the real world, the hateful rhetoric associated with these ideologies is becoming normalized and is sipping into the, main, uh, the mainstream information. The threat from violent extremism, whether it is religiously motivated, think of, think of group like Daesh and Al-Qaeda, or ideologically motivated, continues to represent a very serious threat to public safety. Since 2014, Canadians motivated in all or in part by their extremist ideological views have killed 26 people and wanted, wanted 40 others on Canadian soil. Last year, the government of Canada added four IMVE groups to its terrorist listing regime, and we continue to see an increase in IMVE attacks in Canada and around the world. Lone actors are the primary uh, threat of IMVE, as demonstrated by the tragic attack in London, Ontario in June of last year, where four members of the same family were deliberately targeted and killed and another seriously injured just because they were Muslim. Le SCRS augmente les ressources financières, humaines et opérationnelles que nous consacrons aux enquêtes 
et aux analyses portant sur les menaces qui émanent de l'extrémisme violent à caractère idéologique, ou EVCI. Bien que toute la population soit menacée par l'EVCI et les dynamiques toxiques qui la rendent possible, le sentiment de peur est particulièrement profond pour les peuples autochtones, les personnes de couleur, les minorités religieuses, les membres de la communauté LGBTQ2+, et d'autres groupes qui subissent habituellement le racisme, la discrimination et le harcèlement. C'est catégorie, catégoriquement inacceptable et répréhensible. Je refuse de mâcher mes mots au sujet de cette menace. L'islamophobie, l'antisémitisme et la haine, quelle que soit leur forme, n'ont aucune place au Canada. CSIS continues to increase its resources, financial, human and operational, dedicated to investigating and analyzing ideologically motivated violent extremism. While I envy activity and the toxic dynamics that enable it represents a threat to all Canadians, the sense of fear is particularly acute for Indigenous people, people of color, religious minorities, members of the LGBTQ2 plus communities, and other groups traditionally targeted by racism, discrimination, and harassment. This is categorically unacceptable in Canada. I will not mince my words. There is no place for Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, or hate in any form. The importance of invol involving civil society in a comprehensive and multidimensional response to the threat of violent extremism has been underscored by leading researchers and practitioners studying and counter how to counter this threat. Combating violent extremism requires a concert concerted and coordinated effort by intelligence services, law enforcement, in cooperation with civic and community leaders, academic researchers, and others. I can tell you that CSIS has prioritized engagement with community leaders, members, and advocacy groups, and in our commitment to ensure the safety and security of all Canadians. We cannot counter these threats alone. We are aware of the negative experience that some have had with intelligence and law enforcement services, including CSIS. And now, and now these experiences can resonate in hurtful ways throughout all communities. We are aware that we must work to improve these relationships and rebuild the trust and strengthen the bonds that exist between us. I can tell you that the process has been challenging and not always successful. That's no surprise, but I can tell you that as the director of CSIS, I, I and our skilled intelligence professionals remain committed to diligently and respectfully forging ahead towards building trust with communities across the world, the country, and through a better understanding of our respective needs, meet our common goal of protecting our Canada and its people, our country and its people. At the same time that we are seeing these trends domestically, we are also heavily focused on the actions of authoritarian regimes worldwide and their impacts on, on individuals, communities, and institutions in Canada. We cannot ignore the world around our borders, outside our borders. There is no bubble that can protect us. More than ever, we need to understand threats in an international context so that we can better protect Canadians in our interests, both here and abroad. We must work collaboratively with our allies to counter these threats to democracy and to our citizens. One threat avenue used by states who wish to exert inappropriate influence on Canada and Canadians in order to serve their own interests is foreign interference. Foreign interference is not normal diplomatic conduct or simple lobbying by foreign states. Canada's diplomats uh, work very hard day to day to advance Canada's interest and they do so proudly and openly. Foreign interference on the other end is purposefully covert and deceptive. States cross, states cross line every time they conduct activities that attempt to threaten our citizens, compromise our way of life, undermine our democratic processes, or damage our economic prosperity. These activities are accelerating and they are occurring across all levels of our society and across all levels of governments. Our country's fundamental institutions, including our free press, open academia, our businesses and our democratic institutions are all targets of foreign interference. Transparency is the best course of action here, as most of those targeted for foreign interference are unaware. Sharing what we know about tactics, tools, and areas where states may conduct hostile activities is increasingly part of our job, and we need to be doing this in partnership with all of you. 
On university campuses, foreign states seek to exert undue influence covertly and through proxies by harassing uh, dissidents and suppressing academic freedoms and free speech that are not aligned with their own political interests. Similarly, these actors may attempt to influence public opinion and debate in Canada through interference in our process, in our press and online media. State-sponsored disinformation campaigns represent one way in which states may use hostile activities to discredit our government institutions and negatively impact on our social cohesion. Elected and public officials across all levels of government, representing all political parties, staff, public servant, are also potential targets of foreign interference. Virtually anyone with input or an influence over the public policy making and decision making process is an attractive target for those who look to advance their own interests covertly. Although Canada's electoral system is strong, foreign interference can erode trust and threaten the integrity of our democratic institutions, political system, fundamental rights and freedoms, and ultimately our sovereignty. It is exactly for this reason that CSIS delivers security briefings to elected officials across all orders of government to raise awareness of the threat and provide information for mitigation. Foreign interference activities directed at our democratic institution and processes can be effective ways for foreign states to achieve their immediate, medium, and long-term strategic objectives as they are undermining our own. These activities threaten our prosperity, strategic interest, and national security. Remember when I initially spoke about the uncertainty and ambiguity of the geopolitical environment, foreign interference, uh, foreign interference represents hostile activity that may allow a state to secure a competitive advantage and better position themselves within these rap rapidly evolving dynamics. Canada is a country of open political system, democratic process, social cohesion, academic freedom and prosperity. And this is why people choose to come for ca to Canada. Unfortunately, for the same reasons, Canada is an attractive target for foreign interference. A style activity by state actors also targets the fabric of cult Canada's multicultural society, seeking to influence Canadian communities through threats, manipulation, and coercion. Some of these communities are being exploited to advance the interests of the offending state. Foreign states and individuals acting on their behalf or their direction engage in cyber espionage, spread disinformation via social media, and use threats to silence those who speak out publicly against them. It should come to as no surprise to these, that these threats activities run contrary to Canadian values and freedoms in our national interest. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that much of this activity is taking also place in the, on the, in the cyber realm. Our country remains a target of malicious cyber-enabled espionage, sabotage, foreign interference, and terrorism-related activities. Advanced cyber tools are providing new opportunities to states that may not have historically posed a threat in this domain. At CSIS, we use the powers outlined in our act to investigate these threats, but we're also liaising closely with our foreign and domestic partners and with the private sector. Given the pace of growth in this space and the presence of rapidly emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and quantum computing, we must forge strong partnership with businesses, universities, and communities to ensure that these transformative technologies are not used in a manner detrimental to our national security interests. We have worked hard to rebuild relationships with universities and businesses, but we have much more to do. Again, trust is vital that there is, it is vital that there is an understanding on both sides of how we can both work together. Now that I've provided you with an overview of the threat landscape, I'd like to tell you about the ways in which CSIS is adapting, modernizing, and evolving to ensure that we can meet our mission to provide safety and security for all Canadians. Top of mind in this regard are our efforts to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workforce and we in our workplace to integrate these principles in absolutely everything that we do. CSIS has been working to remove systemic barriers and broad, broaden the organization's understanding and appreciation of diversity of all types. Recognizing that the value of diversity and inclusion in CSIS practices and policies 
help CISOs deliver its mandate much more effectively. Building cultural competence and understanding and learning to apply an intersectional uh, lens help us to better connect with all the communities that we serve. We are also about to launch a new diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy for our organization. This strategy was the result of a considerable review and, and, uh, and discussion and consideration of systemic barriers, discrimination, and racism in the organization. And it was co-developed, and I'm very proud of that, was co-developed with our employees. It includes a concrete action plan with measurable objectives and timelines, as well as steps to ensure accountability and transparency in implementation. We owe our employees, current and future, the very highest priority in this area, and our leadership team is fully committed to the hard work that needs to be done on an ongoing basis. Recruiting and retaining intelligence professional will reflect the environment in which we operate is essential. We have recently launched an intelligence officer recruitment campaign aimed at, at, at increasing representation amongst employee equity, employment equity groups and focusing recruitment efforts across Canada to draw on talent pools outside of the national capital region. Like all organizations, CSIS has also been impacted by the confluence of factors over recent years that disrupted the nature of work and the workplace. Given our unique mandate and high security requirements, our office remained open throughout the pandemic. As director, I am incredibly, incredibly proud of the employees of CSIS, and I would like to thank them for their dedication and service to Canadians. Though this enabled us to continue to deliver on our critical mission, it also raised new complexities and challenges for employees. We are currently in the midst of transformative change aimed at modernizing our workforce to respond to these challenges. Since our people still need to come to the office, we are committed to making it the best possible workplace. At the same time, we are working to leverage technology to enable more flexible working arrangements, harness the power of data, and recruit the digital native intelligence professionals of tomorrow. And on that last point here today, uh, as well as um, being here at a respected, you know, uh, uh, institution of higher learning, uh, I'd like to make a shameless plug to all students. CSIS is a great place to work. And um, uh, please take a look at our website, follow us on Twitter. Yes, we are on Twitter. Um, actually, the first tweet that we ever posted was uh, something like, uh, it is now your turn to follow us. So um, here we go. And uh, I would uh, encourage you to submit a, uh, uh, an application. We offer a, a plethora of interesting and exciting opportunities that will lead you on a path to a prom promising future. Apologies if I if had to say that, but you know, this is an opportunity I cannot miss. I have a captive audience, so here we go. Uh, the supersonic speed of technological change is having a massive impact on us and our world. CSIS needs to make significant investment to capitalize on technology to meet our mission and to equip our workforce of the future. And while technology represents enormous opportunity, it also poses a significant threat to our agency that must protect sensitive sources, information, and tradecraft. We must work in partnerships with the business community and academia to ensure that we are positioned to adapt to a data-driven and technology-rich future. It is absolutely critical to our collective goal of securing our country's national security. At the beginning of my remarks, I focused on the need for us to harden the target. I said that we need to do it together and that we can only do it successfully if our work was underpinned by strong relationships based on trust and transparency. I then laid out the threat environment and the manner in which we see these threats manifesting themselves. In doing so, my objective was to demonstrate that the threats we are facing need to be met with a cohesive and collaborative approach. Building sustained relationships between national security agencies and Canadians we serve has never been more important. Sometimes this is complicated. I will be honest about that. And it's also really hard. But we also, um, sometimes it's clear that we cannot share all of the information because we have to protect the lives of our sources and the lives of our employees. But as I know that uh, we must strive every day to continue to build a trust with Canadians of all communities. And we strive to do this by being as transparent as possible with Canadians. 
L'efficacité du SCRS repose sur les relations que nous, que nous entretenons. Nous en avons besoin pour fournir des renseignements et des conseils fiables et prendre les mesures qui s'imposent pour assurer la protection du Canada. Nous nous engageons à établir avec vous des relations fondées sur la confiance et la transparence. We need relationships to be effective. We need relationships to provide the trusted intelligence, advice, and actions that help keep Canada safe. CSIS is committed to building a trusting and transparent relationship with you. Please join us in achieving that objective. It is crucial that we continue that, uh, the, for the continued success, prosperity, and security of our country, for you, for me, for our families, for our children. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you for those wide ranging comments. It strikes me that even though your objectives and stakes are very different than the ones that we typically face here at the university, the nature of the problems in some respects and the solutions you're looking towards to addressing them is similar. I'd like to remind the audience that um, we're taking questions both from the room and through Slido. So please do uh, follow the link that you've been provided. I'd also like to remind the audience that CSIS deals with security issues rather than policy making, so questions should be directed appropriately in that direction. While we're taking questions, I'll start with one of my own. Uh, you noted political polarization and an increase in social tensions being a major concern of yours, and uh, of course that, um, that is especially the case for racial and religious minorities who are all the more vulnerable. In Vancouver here during the pandemic in particular, there were significant concerns about threats faced by Asian heritage, uh, by Canadians of Asian heritage. Can you speak to us a bit more about what CSIS is doing to address this threat and specifically how are, uh, what is CSIS doing to protect Canada's diverse communities uh, from hate motivated violence? And, and if you could follow that up with a brief one, we got the question through Slido about uh, how to, who to reach out to and how to reach out to when a community member is the subject of threats. Um, thank you very much, Kai. It is a, uh, not only a good question, but an extremely important question. Um, I hope that, you know, through the, the remarks that uh, I've shared with you, you you've got a, a sense of how we are looking at the, kind of the threat environment. And unfortunately, I think the, those st statistics about the number of people who have been targeted in Canada uh, for violent, uh, lethal activities uh, is, is extremely sobering. I had a chance um, a couple of months ago to talk to one of the most prominent experts uh, in anti-racism in Canada. And um, our, that discussion was extremely sobering. That person told me that it's never felt more dangerous to be, a, a racial, uh, to be from a racialized community or from a religious minority group in Canada than it has ever been since World War II. That is extremely sobering when you think of it. We're in 2022 and you know we have uh, there's so many advancement in, in understanding, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh, our, our friends, colleagues uh, who are from religious and, and, and racialized uh, minority groups, you know, feel extremely vulnerable. Uh, we at CSIS have been uh, working, uh, and we've been talking about this much more publicly since about 2018, 2019, about the, uh, the rise of ide ideologically motivated violence. And um, this is something that, you know, of course, uh, there were uh, good reasons why, you know, the uh, number of countries, including Canada, including CSIS, we've been looking at the uh, at religious terrorism, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda, Daesh, and so on. This was uh, absolutely necessary to protect Canadians. But we have started to talk more publicly about the threat of uh, ideologically motivated violence because it was not mainstream. People, you know, were still talking about, you know, right wing, left wing. So we've done a lot of work to try to, um, to work a, a better nomenclature, not just to be more precise, but you know, to understand better the phenomenon, what it meant. And, uh, and this is where we have seen you know, the, the, the rise. Um, uh, I was testifying recently in parliament and I mentioned that we've had, uh, we are now at the point where we're, uh, we're uh, devoting uh, close to 50% of our counterterrorism resources to uh, the threat, to counter the threat of ideologically motivated violent extremists here in Canada. That is a uh, staggering number uh, when you think of it. 
And so um, I think, you know, uh, one of the, uh, the ways we are doing it is, of course, we are using our mandate, the tools to investigate, but also the tools to counter the, the threat. Uh, we are taking a direct action to counter some of that threat. We're not the police. Uh, we're not going to lay charges. We're gonna, not going to bring people to prisons, but we're going to use our tools to make sure that we're able to uh, take action and to uh, prevent uh, and, and diminish the threat that, uh, that uh, minority groups uh, you know, are facing. We also uh, are providing advice to government uh, in terms of, of the phenomenon. We have uh, amazing experts at, uh, at CSIS who are doing uh, some cutting edge uh, research and analysis and are sharing that with government, but also with, with academia. We're engaged quite a bit with academia on this to make sure that we are um, sharing what we know, but also that you know, we are learning from others. And I think this, is, this, this two way streak is essential to understand a very complex uh, social phenomenon that is not only existing in Canada, but is, is existing in most um, democratic countries where we see those tensions taking place. And I think, uh, Kai, you mentioned, you know, that uh, what can people do if they face this? Um, I would say that, you know, uh, and, and it's probably easy for me to, to say in my position of privilege to say, you don't know, speak to authorities. Uh, I know that sometimes there's mistrust of authorities and, you know, what, is, what are people going to do and so on. I can tell you that, uh, and I have some of my colleagues who are here uh, today in the room with us, um, they are extremely uh, diligent at engaging with, with Canadians who have been victimized. Uh, so you can reach out, yes, to CSIS, to police of local jurisdiction, to the authorities. If you're, if you're on campus and you've been, you know, uh, or if you have another person in authority that you know, I would just say, you know, please speak up and engage. Uh, there are ways that can be uh, put in place, you know, to, to help protect. And it's also the more we're going to engage and, and take action, the more we're going to be able to uh, take, uh, make a dent into this phenomenon. So thank you for the question, uh, Kai, and for the audience. Thank you. And I'm going to follow up with a related question from the audience. Uh, a member of our, of our virtual audience asks, what steps is CSIS taking to increase representation in its workforce from underrepresented and or marginalized groups in Canada? So thank you. As I said, you know, this is one of the area that, you know, as an organization, uh, not only uh, do we have to put the mirror in our face and, and see, you know, are we doing enough, but we have to, to recognize that there are systemic barriers that exist in our organizations. And so um, we've taken that step. Uh, the, the work we have been doing on diversity, equity, and inclusion inside the organization has been um, uh, quite telling, and I can tell you, moving at times, I've had the chance to uh, meet personally with uh, with uh, lots of, of our colleagues from CSIS, um, from from different uh, minority groups, BIPOC uh, network, and so on, and in small groups so that they could feel more at ease to to speak with me. And you know, some of their story are uh, stories are really really good. They have had amazing opportunities and great uh, great time. Others have not been the same. And, uh, and what we need to strive to do as a leader in our organization uh, with all of my colleagues is to make sure that you know, this is the, our responsibility to be an effective intelligence service, to be an effective organization, to have to create the best workplace possible for everybody. So I mentioned that we are um, just about to launch our, uh, our co-developed uh, 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 diversity, equity and inclusion strategy. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned in uh, my, uh, my remarks, we have launched very specific targeted, you know, uh, uh, processes to our people uh, directly from, from uh, underrepresented communities. We are um, uh, making headways, but, you know, it's never going to be enough. And this is why also we want to work and, and recruit from outside Ottawa. Uh, we need to, uh, to launch processes. Um, as an organization, that means we need to change some of the, the way we do business. We need to, you know, have uh, opportunity to have people, you know, from all parts of the country to be able to join. But um, if there is one thing I have learned uh, working with my colleagues from uh, the BIPOC communities is that the work is never going to be done, and there will be setbacks. And what I, my personal objective is to make sure that we create an environment where those setbacks are are, are very few and far apart, and that you know they're identified very quickly and addressed diligently and not allowed to fester. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm gonna ask one more follow-up question on, on this general subject. We work quite closely in the policy school with some local First Nations. There is of course 
a very contentious relationship between some First Nations, Indigenous communities, and Canada's security institutions. I'd like to ask what CSIS's perspective is on that and what you're doing to address that trust deficit. Yeah, it is uh, a, a critical uh, issue in our country. Uh, there's a reason why you know uh, we do. Uh, I started with the land acknowledgement. It's because you know we are, you know, in a country that has a rich, rich, uh, long history. With our uh, First Nation uh, friends, you know, were here before us. And um, as an as a traditional national security organizations, we also not an organization that often um, uh, our friends from First Nations communities are looking to join. So we need to make a lot of effort to, to reach out to them. But also, uh, and very importantly, there is also a perception that you know, we are targeting uh, people uh, for who they are. I can tell you one thing, we are really, really busy and our, our law, our acts, our policies, our training is we're not targeting people, we're targeting the threats. So it does absolutely nothing for us to go in and, and, and have a large group of people that will be targeting you know, it, it just doesn't work like that. Our law is also very clear. We, we cannot, you know, direct our activities at lawful protest and dissent. It is not, uh, we, we cannot do that. And um, unfortunately, and it, when I talk about transparency, uh, uh, but at the same time that we have to protect some of our information, we have, uh, we have allowed this to create to, uh, a, a trust deficit to build which is people do not understand what we do and we don't talk about what we do. So sometimes, you know, people will, will you know, have to come up with their own views, uh, their own perspective of what is happening because there's nothing that we can tell people about what we do. And that's why uh, my colleagues and I are much more open and engaging and being in a place like this today to talk about it. Uh, I'll share with you an anecdote, uh, actually not an anecdote, but a, a real fact that, you know, in one of my, my first, external stakeholder that I, I uh, engaged with when I became director was a uh, very influential um, First Nation advocacy group. And uh, I went to talk to them and um, I should be careful because I do not say that too publicly. We're just, you know, on the web. So, but essentially I shared with them some, some information that, you know, it was, was mostly classified. And I said that uh, contrary to what had been said publicly and, and, and interpreted uh, about, you know, some of activities during the I don't know more uh, um, demonstrations across the country that we see CIS had said to our partners that we saw absolutely no threat to national security about it. The weight was represented because the information came out that CSIS was part of some meetings was that CSIS was engaged in, um, in, uh, in uh, as part of the investigation and the cores of measures placed against I don't know more. And that person, I talk, personally talked to that person who went to that meeting and said, I went to tell people that we see this so absolutely no threat to national security. But because we cannot say that publicly, and I just did, but because we are limited in what we can say, you know, the perception, and probably rightly so, when there is a trust deficit, was that that you know CSIS was investigating first station demonstration, which was absolutely not the case. But here we are. And that's why, you know. The only thing I can do, the only thing that you know, uh, all of our professionals, leaders at CSIS do is to engage more transparently. There are limits in what we can say, but at the same time, you know, we, what we are asking people is from time to time, just give us a little bit of the benefit of the doubt and engage with us. And then if that engagement turns out that you know, you're all right, then just go out in the public space and, and, and say that. But sometimes it is another side to the story that you know, we, we would like to, uh, to be able to, to share with, with people. And that's why I say, you know, we, that's trust that we need to earn. It's just not something that should be given to us. But uh, I, I'm confident that, you know, we have amazing, uh, dedicated people at CSIS who are working extremely hard to protect Canadians every day. And I'm convinced that when we have a chance to engage in those discussions, you know, that will be helpful to, uh, to uh, increase confidence that we are uh, indeed here to protect every Canadian. Thank you for that. I'm going to take another question from our online audience. That is that how is CSIS looking to partner with traditional, e.g. the Five Eyes and non-traditional security partners, like-minded countries, to tackle the well-documented national security challenges posed by the People's Republic of China? Yes. Um, so there is uh, one distinction that I make when we, we talk about uh, the, the threats. I said that we uh, earlier that we do not target people. 
we target threat activity. And uh, the threat activity is, is not coming from, from Chinese uh, citizens. It's coming from uh, the actions and directions of the, the Chinese Communist Party. And so uh, I don't want just to be clear that, you know, we are not, and you know, we have very, uh, Canada and, and China, uh, yeah, we have very, very vibrant, you know, exchanges and engagement that is, you know, to the benefit of both countries. Unfortunately, uh, over the last uh, number of years, we have seen an increase in, uh, in, in activities by China uh, that has been, you know, directed at our values, our economic prosperity, our, our democracy. Um, we have seen uh, very overt issues, like, for example, legislation passed that forces every citizen, every person of Chinese origin, every country, every uh, company, organizations working uh, or having a link with China to support their intelligence service, which means that, you know, it creates the environment for coercion and to force people anywhere in the world to collaborate with the intelligence services for the benefit of, of, uh, of the, part, the Chinese Communist Party, often to the detriment of the individual involved or to the country that they are now uh, they are living in. And so we are, uh, our approach is to, uh, to be very um, precise in our analysis. Uh, we do not, uh, we're not in the business of, 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 of looking at, you know, everything that, that uh, China does is a threat. We're, looking, we're very much looking at you know, how specific activities, specific individuals involved in those activities. We are sharing information with, with a lot with academia. Uh, we're learning quite a bit working with, with, uh, with specialists you know, uh, across uh, Canada and the world about uh, their own analysis. We don't believe that we, we understand the entire phenomenon on our own. And working with our international uh, and domestic partners in the national security field, both, yes, with the Five Eyes, but also with a number of other partners. We see this have, uh, have um, uh, arrangements to work with partners around the world with more than 300 uh, organizations. So we work very much across the world to better understand, better able to get the information. And I think, you know, the, the question here is to make sure that, you know, our role as a national security intelligence service is to provide the government with the right advice and information you know, to be able to shape public policy, shape, you know, the decision making and to help guide uh, the country in advancing in a relationship that is crucial uh, for, for the prosperity and the sovereignty of Canada is to better understand the modus vivendi between Canada and, and the, the China is essential. Um, but at the same time, we do so to protect uh, our sovereignty, our economic prosperity and our democratic processes against uh, uh, interference and espionage. Thank you for that. I'd like to take, keep the focus briefly on, on the Asia Pacific and then turn to the audience uh, in the room for the next question. You referenced the importance of cultural competence. Right? There's great anticipation of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, a forward-looking vision that, uh, that addresses what we anticipate are going to be significant changes in the global center of gravity of power of commerce uh, over the next several decades. At the policy school here, we emphasize situated place-based knowledge, right? taking very seriously the importance of context and understanding that context, getting that context right in order to properly understand uh, developments. What is CSIS doing to deepen its knowledge of the varied contexts and increased capacities, uh, and increase its capacities to deal with what is an incredibly diverse region, if we're talking Indo-Pacific, made up of many different countries, many different cultural uh, in, in political systems? It's a very uh, good question. Thank you, Kai. Um, you will never uh, be uh, surprised to hear someone, you know, leading a, uh, an organization say, you know, they have, uh, we are stretched for resources. And so it is the case for us as well. Uh, the, the threat environment is, is so complex and what we have to do, you know, is, is extremely uh, demanding. But at the same time, we've made uh, a decision a couple of years ago to invest more resources. And we created a branch called Academic Outreach and Strategic Engagement. And that is um, uh, the people of CSIS who are there, uh, who are essentially the ones who are creating the connective tissue you know, that allowed for this to happen today. So we're working you know, with, with uh, Canadian and international academia. We're working with, uh, with experts in different fields to enrich our, our understanding, enrich our knowledge, 
We do that uh, at the um, at the unclassified level. We organize, you know, a, a symposium and, uh, and and different conferences to be able to to get people together and and share knowledge and share understanding and enrich our perspective. And we also do that by doing our own intelligence operations and investigations. The one thing that is clear is that everybody is struggling to to better understand um, the nuances are are uh, are uh, essential here. Um, when you start to, to provide, you know, uh, intelligence to inform the decision-making process of such a complex relationship, you need to make sure you have your uh, you understand these nuances really well. So that uh, engagement with academia is critical for us, and so um, we are also looking to enrich formal and informal um, uh, participation of uh, of academia in our processes. Um, would be very interested uh, for all. Uh, uh, analysts and experts who are interested in a, in a stint working with us, um, you know, we are open for business. But the, the reality is that I think, you know, uh, it's realization, not just from CSIS, but from uh, many other organizations in Canada, that we need to, to better understand uh, the dynamics uh, in, uh, in, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and specifically with China. It is, uh, Canada will not be a prosperous sovereign country if we don't get this right. Thank you for that. Let me turn to the audience if there are any questions. And we'd particularly like to hear from students. Hi. Thank you for the speech, of course. Um, given the increase in polarization and misinformation spread on, on social media, specifically Meta, various platforms of Meta and uh, Twitter have, um, especially given you know the onset of the pandemic, um, how is this approaching um, the spread of misinformation, increasing polarization through specifically social media channels and, and the digital lifestyles that we are increasingly a part of um, to address this misinformation that's being spread? That, that's a, a very important and very complex question at the same time. Uh, I'll, I'll use a, um, a concrete example to, to describe maybe a, a part of the complexity. So uh, we uh, at CSIS are a uh, founding member of the Security Intelligence Task Force on uh, elections interference. So we are working with our colleagues from the Communication Security Establishment, Global Affairs Canada, and the uh, RCMP to essentially uh, collectively look at you know, the threats to our election uh, processes, electoral processes. And uh, one of the uh, difficult area is you know, who should be looking at social media. So we have the mandate and the authorities to look through so, 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 to social media, but it has to be targeted. It has to be specific, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, we have uh, information that, you know, you are part of, uh, uh, you are cover for, you know, a uh, country that's trying to spread this information, it's legitimate for us to be looking at what you're doing on social media. But what will not be legitimate and what I would not want to see in a democracy is for the intelligence service just to go out and, you know, uh, just, you know, uh, monitor social media writ large. That would not work. And I can tell you, we would not have the resources. And, but it will also not be effective. And so the question we have now is that I think it's a very important element when, when you look at the architecture of, of, of how we do business from, from a, a, a government level is, you know, who should be best placed to do that? I think there's a, there's a very important role for academia uh, to do that. We've seen in the last elections, there have been a number of, uh, of organizations um, that used um, tools that, um, uh, were uh, not allow, uh, available to us, but we, we would have had to go in, uh, to federal court to get a warrant to be able to do what uh, what a uh, uh, professors and and, and uh, academics and, and and the students were able to do. So I think there is a role for uh, outside uh, of the of the federal government realm to to do that. I think the federal government needs to do more, but I think also and, and this is absolutely critical. And this is why you see this is a very contentious political issue at the same time. What is the role of government interacting with with uh, with social media platforms? What is the role of government to regulate or not? And um, I have no specific views to share on that today, other than to say it's very complex. And the more we talk about how best to address it, the the less chance we're going to have to find the wrong solution to it. And so um, I think it's uh, we are taking some uh, some specific measures. As I said, we have the mandate, you know, to. Uh, to uh, investigate, analyze, produce intelligence, but also take actions. So we were able to take actions on, on, uh, on uh, some disinformation campaign that we see, uh, and, and we, uh, we are using these powers. But it's also a very targeted and small 
uh, approach when you look at the spread of this information. Uh, and I do believe this is one of the most important question about in social cohesion in the country for the next uh, number of years. So when you come up with the answer, please let us know. Thank you for that. Let me stick with the student theme. We have a question from our online audience, from one of our students, um, that thanks you for the for the the speech and asks, what would you recommend to people who want to work at CSIS? And I'm going to ask, I'm going to broaden that question a little bit. Uh, we of course spend much of our time as faculty thinking about the skill sets that our students should leave this program with. Both speaking for CSIS, but generally with your understanding of what it takes to be a useful analyst. What skill sets are you looking for? What would you suggest to a student who has aspirations either to work at CSIS or, or somewhere else in the analyst position? So um, at CSIS, what is interesting is that you have um, many different fields of expertise, you know, where that we is, uh, is essential for us. We have, uh, I mentioned Alice, um, the way we collect information and we produce intelligence is by having uh, intelligence officers, uh, spies who are engaged domestically and internationally. Uh, we are present in many countries around the world uh, where we do our uh, carry out our activities. Um, we have technology specialists, we have a linguist, we have amazing linguists in our organization. We have, um, we need to have the best possible, you know, human resources, financial people, because our, our work is complex. We have to do things differently because we have to obfuscate sometimes, you know, how we do business. Um, we have great policy people. Uh, so essentially the list of, you know, of, of, of potential different uh, um, uh, functions at CSIS is quite long. Uh, it's also an area where you can work in different fields. Like, you know, we have intelligence officers who have worked on the field for a number of years and have uh, uh, cross-trained to become analysts or become policy specialists. Um, we also have, um, if you're uh, interested in law, we also in, uh, in need of great lawyers to make sure we are following the path and that you know, uh, we are uh, not uh, striving away from, uh, uh, from uh, the, the lawful uh, regime that uh, is, uh, is ours. But uh, the main thing I would say is that, um, and I have a chance, you know, I, every time we have new employees to come in, you know, through cohorts and the, they are coming to the service. And uh, every time I can, I go and meet with them, with, uh, with the small group of people. And I ask them, why did they join CSIS? Why did they want to join us? And uh, I can tell them why I joined, uh, because, you know, I really uh, want to make a difference. I really want to have a chance to, uh, to, to uh, have an impact on, on, on our country and uh, protecting our, our fellow citizens. It's, uh, you know, I remember one that comes to mind was a computer engineer from actually UBC who came in and worked uh, and, and, and joined and moved to Ottawa to work with us. And I, uh, I said, you know, you would have been able to find, you know, more uh, lucrative employment in the private sector. You know, you may not have had to move to Ottawa and so on. And um, it was, um, I would say, extremely reassuring to hear the answer. It says, look, yes, I can, you know, I could probably have made more money, uh, could have, you know, done something different, but I really want to do something with purpose. I really want to do something that, you know, will, will, will not just give, a, give me a paycheck at the end, but, you know, will give me the, 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 the feeling that, you know, I've contributing to something bigger, something that, you know, matters. And you know, uh, yeah, there is it's a fairly noble cause to say that you know every day, what you do, what your colleagues do, irrespective of the jobs, when you're at CSIS, you help keep Canadian safe. That's pretty cool. So I, I would say that you know there is a uh, there is a uh, there are opportunities. The one thing we need to do when I talk about transforming uh, the organization, the culture, we the workplace, the the, the demands that you know people to say, look, you know. I don't want necessarily to have to move. I don't want necessarily to have to, to go to uh, the different places, uh, but I really would like to serve. So we need to, to transform our own uh, practices to make sure that we are providing those opportunities to people to work in different places and to work in different ways. Um, you cannot do um, work for CSIS and, and work full-time in, in, in your apartment, uh, but that is not gonna work. However, you know, uh, there is, you know, we need to evolve to a place where we can continue to provide, you know, new different opportunities. But I think that's the value proposition we have is to have, come and join CSIS so that you can have an opportunity 
And you know, hopefully you're gonna stay a long time. Maybe you're gonna stay five years, you're gonna do something different. You're gonna you know, learn something different, be in a different environment, and then you may come back. But I would say the value proposition is that you, know, you come in and every day you do something with, with lots of meaning and purpose. Thank you for that as well. We've reached the end of our hour. It's 12 o'clock local time. So please join me in thanking the director for those really thoughtful comments as well. I, I enjoyed this discussion and I hope this is a discussion that we can continue to have as a university, but more broadly that you'll have with other universities in Canada as well. Thank you very thank much. You so thank much. you so much. Thank you, Kai. Thank you.